Welcome everybody to Matthew's Interviews. Today's guest joined YouTube January 10th of 2014. 38,470,699 estimated account views. He has 621 videos, 220,000 subscribers, and his most popular video is 10 scary and strange park ranger horror stories with 823,000 views. Please welcome the man, the myth, the legend, Swamp Dweller. Good afternoon, Swamp. How are you today, my man? I am not too bad, my friend. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. I have been so excited to have you here since the thought even arrived in my mind. So my only real, like, question for you besides one other is what got you into narrations um honestly it's kind of it's like a whole long process of how it happened but in reality is I, I just had a podcast for a couple of years i interviewed people who allegedly seen you know cryptid creatures or paranormal things you know uh, also paranormal and cryptid researchers as well and i kind of got bored because you know how many times can you ask the same question or try to rethink of questions to ask the people who have you know maybe seen things that exist or don't exist so um at the time i had a friend he was a narr one of the og scary story uh, creepypasta narrators his name is king spook um and he was like maybe you should try you know narrating or telling scary stories so i started a, a random channel i don't even remember the name of it at this point and uh tried a few like scary stories from let's not meet and honestly i just was like this is it's really stupid. <laughs> I do not like this. Um, and uh, so I kind of gave up. And then um, King's Boot kept kind of being like, I think you have a voice for it. Maybe you should try a different way. And then I thought, well, when I did my podcast, I used to get sent all kinds of stories from people who didn't want to come on and wanted to remain anonymous and still share their story with me. So I thought, why not just start narrating these stories and see what happens and kind of change what I was doing before? and kind of morph it into something you know more catered to what i like and so it kind of just began that way i just started narrating you know dogman stories and cryptid stories and all kinds of ghost stories and it kind of just continued to spread into the park ranger stuff and everything else that i do so it's just uh it was kind of just like a, a random process and kind of just like a random uh friend is kind of poking at me being like hey man why don't you try it Oh man, that sounds like it was a it was a fun time to you know be pushed to do something that eventually would really lead to something successful for you. Yeah, yeah it was definitely a cool well. experience. I mean, I know like I, I feel like my story is a little weird because most people you know they're like, oh, I was a, a fan of this person and that's what made me want to do it. For me, I was like, I don't even know what the heck a, a corpse husband was. I was like, what's that? And people, it's like you listen to this guy's <laughs> stories. I'm like, I don't even know what that is, dude. But, uh, <laughs> When I uh, kind of fell into this whole world, you know, tripping over it, and suddenly I was like, oh, there's a bunch of people that do this. What's happening? Well, you know, I'm Here really glad you did. Like, you have become so well-known, you know, in the community as a big figure in a lot of ways. And your stories are interesting as hell. And your narration, your voice, bro, your voice is just out of this world unbelievable. You have such a distinct voice. I think that's uh, the only thing I can claim about myself, at least without having some sort of ego, so at least my voice is noticeable, I guess. Well, I mean, admitting that you have a skill of some sort, you know, some kind of a special ability, like a voice like yours isn't boasting. I mean, to be, you should be proud of something like that. Not a lot of people can pull off the voice that you can pull off. Yeah, it's just a, it's a weird thing for me, for sure. Most of my... Like, I got made fun of for how I talked, actually, my entire life. That's why I'm, like, kind of, really? like, super, like, like, I definitely talk a lot different now. Like, I'm more articulate. I'm more uh, measured. I have a much better cadence. But still to this day, there's a lot of words that I cannot say. And as, as many times as you yell at me, it's not going to change. And <laughs> um, I have, uh, I don't know, I just always got made fun of for how I talked, you know, my, my little stammers and stutters and such like that. Um, ultimately I feel like, you know, it's become who I am online and people have come to love the little weird, I guess, um, idiosyncrasies of my voice. So 
I mean, I'm as a fan, a longtime fan, I must say, proudly, uh, you know, your voice has evolved a lot since you started, and for the better, much much more right. for the better. You know, I really agree to your testament that you know you've gotten a lot better about it, and your voice is just spectacular. But like, do you have uh, other people you like love to talk to or wish you could, uh, you know, collab with? Like, have you have you met anyone that you really found? To be interesting since you joined like this whole community this community is huge oh man <laughs> this the uh, swamp dweller saga of all kinds of crap that i've experienced in this community but um <laughs> there are there have been some really awesome people i have like been before twitter smited me i was in contact with so many people i never even like imagined i'd be in contact with it was absolutely insane all the people that were like oh yeah i watch your videos like oh really okay you know who i am that's crazy um, but I would probably say the only person I haven't talked to, like outside of a few tweets, you know, kind of trolling each other and, um, that I haven't collabed with is Lazy Masquerade. I would absolutely, uh, that's like the only narrator I actually listen to. So I would, uh, definitely fangirl on that. Um, I also think it would be interesting because for some reason I get an, a, an unhealthy amount of comments of people saying I sound like, um, <laughs> Lazy Masquerade. So to me, it's just like I don't I don't know how I sound like an English man. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't understand either. Like you said, I get it all the time. Maybe like the more American version of lazy, but your voices don't even have like the same decibel level. Like, oh, he's that's an insult to lazy. I'm like, come on, man, don't insult the man. Yeah, I mean, guys, you're guys definitely not English. Lazy. You're definitely not English. We can both attest to that right now. <laughs> oh yeah i get that a lot too is uh where are you from what's your accent i'm just like i, I just don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i don't know where i'm from i just have an accent um you have an accent though like i don't really hear an accent a lot some people say i do some people say i don't M more people outside of the states say they hear it than inside of the states but um i think i have a pretty distinct like southern accent but i think it's pretty it's very light like I, I come from like most of my family talks like this and I kind of just talk like this. I have some words like all oh, and stuff like that, that I cannot say, right. <laughs> but, right. but uh, you know, I'm just, I'm out here. I'm from, I'm from the South. That's how we say stuff. I mean, that's, yeah. that's where I'm like earlier when people made fun of me, they say volume instead of volume because everybody down here says volume, turn the volume down. I'm just like, all right. Oh man. Cool. I actually just moved down to the Southern States myself and it is much different. Like, where I'm from. A whole different language, man. It is. <laughs> it's like, like a whole different... <laughs> the dialect is crazy. It's like when you go to the West Coast, that's where my girlfriend's from. And we're, we're, we go and visit there like once a year. And when I go over there, I'm just like, what are you guys even saying? <laughs> it's not even happening half the time. <laughs> it's like, like, I'm so confused. Like the slang is just different. The dialect, it just changes. That's why like uh, the one thing a lot of people get probably crap for when they're a narrator is like, you're pronouncing this wrong. But it's like potato, potato, you know? So yeah. It's kind of like, where are you from? Dialect exists. Yeah, like, again, the potato, potato. Everyone says the same words a little bit differently. You, you can't expect two people to say it the exact same unless, you know, they're both from the same place. And I find it funny that people really, like, not that's not how you say that word. No, that's how you say that word. I mean, you say it just a bit differently. Oh, now, man, but then... But then they'll call you all kinds of names, and you're like, yeah, but that's just how I say it. Well, you're stupid. <laughs> it's like, okay. Sure, <laughs> sure. I guess I'm stupid then. Um. No, I've seen it all. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, people get so upset about that kind of stuff. And it's usually people that aren't even, like, from that area. Like, if you say, like, a name of a town wrong, they get so mad. Most of the people that are from there, it's actually said like this. Heads up. And it's like, thanks, bro. The other people are like, you're so stupid. It's not so. It's like, it's like oh, you're not even God. from here. Why do you care? Like... Oh man, I experienced that when I moved down to where I live now, because I live in South Carolina, and um, there's a place called Shallot, and or Shallot. I think it's actually pronounced Shallot, but I kept on calling it Shallot because it's spelled like Shallot, and I, I had no idea. So one day someone was like, "Oh no, it's not. You don't say it like Shallot. It's it's Shallot." And I'm like, Shallot. They're like, "Yeah, are you?" Are you new? Are you stupid? I'm like, did you just call me stupid? And they're like, no, I don't mean like, are you actually stupid? But like, how do you not know how to pronounce it? 
Well, well, I mean, maybe it's because I just moved down here less than a year ago. And they're like, oh, right. Okay. And then, and then they just stop. They just, like, they just move on because they realize they fucked up really quick. <laughs> <laughs> they fucked it's, up. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I've lived in places most of my, my whole life, and I still don't know how to say them sometimes. I'm just like, dude, I live in a place where, like, every other town is some seminal creek word. I can't even be bothered <laughs> to learn it. Like, are you kidding me? It looks like a bunch of random letters. I'm not even kidding. It's like, it's like man, I'm just going home. Dude. Sounds like you live in Alabama. <laughs> Oh man, I live in Florida, man, and it's just every town here. Like, especially if you get to like the central, where north central area, like where, where, uh, in Florida. Oh, you live in Florida? So I, yeah, I live in the Tampa area right now. So, okay. Okay. Uh, but where I grew up, I lived a little bit more north. So, like everything up there is just like all these seminal names, and it's just like you can't even. <laughs> I'm just like I haven't even bothered to learn them. So people down there is like, you don't know how to say this. I was like, why would I honestly bother <laughs> to learn these words? Like, I'm never gonna go to this town. Does it really matter? Right, exactly. Like, why does it matter? And besides, even if I needed to go to that town, I would just go to Google Maps and spell it out. Like, I don't need to say the word. I just need to spell it out, and it'll bring me to that town. So why do I need to learn it? <laughs> Definitely. And it's like it's like it's not like this is for a video, man. If it's for a video, I'll do my best to learn it. But right. uh, um, you know, if you're discretion advised. Yeah, if you were discussion was, I'm gonna get it wrong. Be prepared. I'm probably going to molest your your local language, and I am sorry. <laughs> I'm going to molest your local language. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, all the Australians out there know that, like, outside of Melbourne, I cannot pronounce anything correctly over there. So, <laughs> you ever been like out of the states? Um, yeah, I've been to Canada and like yeah. Mexico, but I haven't been like you know out of the continent or anything yeah yeah what what's uh what was that like for you did you experience anything fun it was it was fine it was for um my job that i was doing back then so it was fun it was uh, a good time a lot of a lot of good memories a lot of interesting bar fights and stuff that i witnessed Ooh. but uh it was interesting you know nothing you know nothing to write home about right but, right uh, you know, it's not too much different because it's not like I went to like Tijuana or you know Cancun or anything. I was just like right over the border, like near Laredo and stuff. So it's kind of like it's uh, Mexico, but it's not Mexico. It's not like deep Mexico. It's like the the tip of Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it sounds like you have a career outside of YouTube, or you did at least. Yeah, I've lived a few different lives. You've lived a few different lives. Ain't nothing wrong with that, As though. They say. Yeah, you ever been to college or anything like that? Um, school was definitely, like, the, the way school, I guess, was set up to where I lived it definitely was not working for me. Once uh, I got into high school and was more conscious of, like, what I was interested in and what I wanted to be. And being ADD and bipolar didn't help either, so. Um, oh, I know <laughs> honestly, that feeling. I, uh, I actually started doing stuff, like, I was in touring metal bands since, like, the age of 13. So, like, I was kind of, like on focused on completely different other things and did not care to my detriment when i was older obviously like now i'm just like oh man i wish i took my high school years more seriously but um <laughs> back then yeah i was running hard um i didn't really i don't know what, are, you, what, really what are some uh, metal bands you really enjoy um i'm actually interested in this one i love metal well, I love, I, first of all, I love all music. It, if it makes my head bop, I love it. It could be hip hop, it could be country, it can be yeah. metal. Um, but some metal bands, right off the top of my head, I, uh, I was just listening to August Burn and Dread right before this. Um, Ooh. Uh, I'm a fan of them. Um, August, the vocalist of August Burn and Dread's mother was actually my homeroom teacher in high school. So that was really? Cool. Um, yeah, she, she was awesome, man. She got me tickets when I, was six, when I turned 16 to their show that was coming through town. It was awesome, man. She was wow. great. Um, so August Burn Dread for sure. I say As I Lay Dying. Um, I've been on a big metal core kick right now. So uh, Carnifex mm -hmm. is a big one. I like Carnifex a lot. Um, I just kind of, it's kind of hard for me to name ones because I just like so yeah. many. It's just yeah. like, what, what, what am I feeling that day really? Yep, I am much the same. Like I will listen to any kind of music if it makes, if, it, if I like it. If I like the song, I like the song. Like I don't care what genre. And like how am I feeling that day? Because I'm just like you. I'm bipolar as hell, man. So there are some days where it's like, I love a little rap and hip hop and I'll listen to that all day, but I can't stand to hear metal that day. But the next day I will listen to metal all day. Like Sabaton, boy, you put on some Sabaton, man. And you, you put on some Sabaton, give me some vodka and you got a party. Oh yeah. You have a party going on. <laughs> like, 
That's a good time, dude. I oh, saw yeah. them uh, like two years ago. They really? were great. Yeah, oh, they yeah, looked fun that. as hell. That's something that's uh, brought me together with quite a few like people in the nation community. There's a lot of cool people that are into metal. Like uh, Unit 522 is a big metalhead. Dr. Really? Creepin for sure. Wow. Um, a, lot, a lot of people that you wouldn't expect. But yeah, like people really uh, jam out here in this community. And uh, me and Unit have gone to cut quite a few shows. I think the last one we went to together was uh, Nile and Terrorizer. And I uh, can't remember who else was on there, but there was somebody else. Wow. Sounds like you've had a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, definitely. Now, I gotta, so I gotta ask, and this is gonna be my only other, like, real official question for you. Have you, like, it sounds like you've lived in some states where cryptid activity and supernatural kind of go hand in hand, and it's, you know, much more believed than in other places. But have you personally ever experienced any kind of cryptid, um, and have you ever experienced anything paranormal? Um, I guess I should start this with uh, a little bit of, uh, I guess, kind of going into why I started YouTube in general is uh, be- why I even started my podcast before I became the whole Swamp Roller channel and all that was because I had seen some weird things that I couldn't really explain that seemed to fit this recent phenomenon at the time that was starting to spark up online called Dogman. Oh. And I was like, well, this, this kind of seems a lot like what I saw. And I went on one of the very first episodes of a very popular podcast called Dogman Encounters, where I shared my my encounter with a nice gentleman named Vic Cundiff, who was the man who is the entire reason that I'm here. He was like, I like your voice. I think you have a good mindset, and I think you should start a podcast of your own. And that's when I started mine and started doing my own thing. Um, with that said, I very much believe in, I'm very much a hard skeptic, and that will never change simply because there are plenty of explanations and whether we can say it scientifically or you know what, what supernaturally or whatever i don't think we can ever actually really explain it so why even bother trying to put your belief into something that's kind of that's how i look at it what i do think though is there's obviously more than we can explain out there energy is something we cannot just uh deny um there is science proves that energy leaves the body when you die which would be very reminiscent of a soul and um when it comes to cryptids, uh, cryptids obviously exist, but it's obviously just a pseudoscience of zoology. So um, I love cryptid zoology because my favorite story is that of Pongo, which is the how we discovered gorillas. People thought Pongo back in the day were these vicious creatures that would come and eat people and kill them and steal their women and rape them and all this stuff. And they turned out to be these actually incredibly mild and gentle creatures um, that we all know and love today. And that was only a little over 100 years ago that they were discovered. So, you know, more recently, we've discovered things like vampire deer. We've discovered things like uh, giant squids or colossal squids, excuse me, and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, so what, who's to say Sasquatch can't exist, right? Um, or who's to say that the Loch Ness Monster didn't live at one time? Or who's to say that there wasn't a small population of dinosaurs living in the Congo at one point? Who's to say? So, um, I don't know. Like, I feel that obviously they have to be real. And for encounters, I've had a lot of weird things happen to me. Um, I, I don't really promote them as anything more than just some weird stuff that I've seen. I have a ton of, uh, I have a few that I can definitely say were probably just tracked back to stress-induced um, hallucinations of sorts, or maybe just stress-induced um, you know, paranoia. But there are some that I 100% can't deny. And um, the first one that I guess I'll share with you real quick was the one that I shared with Vic Cundiff all those years ago. Is um, I was driving down a road, the road that they actually filmed um, Jeepers Creepers on. Um, I was driving down this road. It was probably 2 or 3 a.m. I just got off a night shift. I believe I was working at Walmart at the time. And um, this road is pretty much empty. If you've ever seen the movie, it literally looks like that till this day. <laughs> um, it's actually right by where my dad lives. And, Wait, um, which I'm Jeeper going... Creepers? The first? Uh, the first one, yes. Is it, is it the um, road with that tree where they're like being chased mm-hmm. by the truck? Yeah, the road that they're driving on, it's all this. Uh, this road's actually not that long. But uh, yeah, it's all in this little road right there, all the fields. Okay. And actually, if you uh, I believe the second one, when the high school bus and they throw the you know, the thing, and that that's that's the same road, too. Oh, really? Um, mm-hmm. Um, 
they actually shot those both those movies in like two locations so it's super weird like one location in florida then one like up north or something like that wow. so it's like super super interesting so like you'll see like two shots in that movie one shot of like the movie and then it'll be like in the florida field and then on the other side suddenly there's cornfields it's like what <laughs> so it's like what happened is it the same field it's like a cow field to a cornfield that happens really awkwardly but um yeah i was driving down this road it was very foggy that night and that's not that's not usually typical for this time of year normally in the summer it's really you know humid and dry not humid or dry excuse me it's just really humid and you know hot and you don't really get too much fog yeah. but um it was uh, unusually foggy and it looked like there was something laying in the road uh, you know like i said this is a cow field so i thought maybe a cow got out or something was laying in the road or, uh-huh. or whatever was happening maybe something got hit I was I was unsure because we got everything in Florida, man. We got everything from wolves, bobcats, panthers, bears. Yeah, you guys got, got like got a it. good healthy um, mix of many different creatures. Well, we got we got everything. You every, people think Florida's all beaches, man. It's like nah, man. Most of Florida yeah. is honestly just Tennessee with oceans around it. Pretty but much. um, uh, I was coming up on this thing at the time. I was driving in this small little 2001 Honda Civic, Ooh. and um, anybody. Most people know them. These are really small cars. They're <laughs> small, but like, they are loud. Like, I, oh, yeah. Um, this one was definitely not. This was more of a four-door sedan one, kind okay. of a mom car. Okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, it was, so, so you had the mom it version. Was still really slow. <laughs> it was my first car. I was super stoked. But uh, um, <laughs> it was uh, really low to the ground still. So when I would stand out, like, I'm six feet tall. Like, So when I stand out above it, I'm, like, a good three feet t- taller than the car. So um, um, when this thing, I come up to this thing, I stopped probably 10 feet away from it. And like, this thing was massive. Like, I was like, what the hell is happening? Like, this is the biggest bear I've ever seen in Florida. And uh, I turn on my brights to try to see it better. And suddenly I see these, you know, eyes open and they're like just red, like super blood red. Like, like honestly, something you would expect to see in the horror movies. Like if you saw like a werewolf or something like this, like they're not glowing, but they're just like this deep red. And on like the way they're reflecting in the um, the the high beams is just menacing as hell. And this thing stands up. When this thing stands up, it goes from you know being this mass on the ground to probably being a good six and a half feet, seven feet tall. And this thing is yoked, my friend. Like this thing looks like it straight up spends all day in the gym. And it's got like this like brownish, reddish fur kind of. And then, like, towards the legs, it almost kind of looks more hyena-ish. It was kind of weird. And um, I didn't really get a good, good look at its face um, or its claws too much. This thing does the most cliche thing, though. It, like, stands up and just walks into the field. And then I do the typical thing. Like, I'm, I'm tripping. Like, what the hell? You know, I look over, try to see if it's there. But it's pitch black out there. You know, there's no yeah. lights. There's, there's no street lights, no nothing. So I, can, I can't tell if I just saw something, made it up, or what, because I'm tired or what happened so i drive home i go to i go to bed i I have these just weird nightmares i have my first encounter with sleep paralysis ever which uh was absolutely terrifying um i woke up in the middle of the night and those red eyes were just there in the corner of my room and then i see this thing standing up and i next thing i remember is like i find this screaming and i finally sit up i'm like what the fuck it's like this is crazy like this is absolutely nuts (laughs) um and then I think after that, I just had a lot of stress-induced encounters. I had a lot of, like, paranoia that I was feeling where I felt like... I guess I'll share one real quick. There's this, like, I think this one's more of a paranoia thing, but it was such an intense feeling that I have never felt in my life. Me and my friend were, again, in my little Honda Civic, parked out in the back of middle of nowhere by the swamps where I grew up. And we're just, like, smoking a little bit, you know, just, you mm-hmm. know, I just got off work. We're just chilling, you know. We're just two stock boys at Walmart chilling. Right, And, right. um... I just, uh, I just remember, I just felt from the moment that we parked there, I swear I saw something in my, my rear view mirror. I was like, I swear I saw something. But I was like, no, I'm tripping, I'm tripping. But then I just felt like this, also this like weird feeling like I was being watched from my, si- from my driver's side window. And I mentioned it a few times to my friend, and he was like, nah, I don't, I don't see anything, I don't feel anything, I think you're just tripping, dude. Um, again, it's pitch black out here. We're in the middle of nowhere. Like We're so far back in the swamp that they don't even have high-speed internet. They have to have like the dish stuff or whatever. Ooh. Um, so like we're, we're like not like – we're probably about 20-something miles from town, and my wow. little town is literally a, a Walmart. So <laughs> <laughs> like the whole town is built around this little Walmart. It's, it's funny. Um, but 
we're sitting there and I just increasingly feel more weirded out. And then I'm looking in my rear view mirror and there's this one street light on this street and it's orange and dim and it doesn't light up jack shit, but it's there and at least it's there. And I'm saying in my mind, I'm like, at least we have this little glow 500 feet away from us. <laughs> and I'm seeing, I swear, slowly emerge this massive shadow. And I'm just Whoa. like, I'm like, come on, bro. I'm just like, I'm tripping. I'm just trying to chill. It's been a long day. We had to do two trucks today. I'm sore. Let me just have a good day. <laughs> and this shadow keeps coming closer very slowly. And it gets to a point to where I swear it's like reaching out a, a hand or a paw or a claw or whatever to touch my car. And the moment that I see it about to touch, my friend says, what the hell is that? I turn on the car Whoa. so fast and I speed so fast out of there that I never thought that was possible. And me and him Jeez. both were freaked out. We didn't even want to drive back to his house because we're like at the end of his driveway. He's got one of those long, you know, driveways that go into the little swamp he lives in. And it's right. like, man, yes, dude. Like, uh, it was it was pretty um, terrifying because it was like this hulking figure. And the only thing I could really focus on was the head. It had like these german shepherd looking ears and that's this is all i remember i was like this is and they were twitching every so often like they were listening and that's what i was like i was like what the hell like, i think that was paranoia uh could be stress induced paranoia or something like that i mean it was a stressful time for me all around i want to agree but like your friend like clearly saw it because he asked you what the hell is that yeah he definitely i don't know you know it could be a placebo thing you never know. He could be of, you know, feeding off my obvious anxious or anxiety. But, uh, you know, it's one of the, it's creepy stories, man. And it I got is. tons of stuff like that with the paranormal as well. You know, Ooh, let's I hear them. Let's hear them. Uh, I, I lived in a haunted cabin in Tennessee. Okay. I'm okay. um, in the middle of nowhere once again, like 45 miles away from the nearest town, 35, something like that. Um, I always give like a very vague range because it's like it's between 30 and like 50 miles. Like we were really in the middle of nowhere in the Smoky Mountains. Like yep. it was a it was a time right. and um we all our neighbors you know we just did like there were cattle farms stuff like that and they were miles away and stuff like that and uh this this cabin was built in 1802 um i remember when we first moved in i was uh clearing all the bushes behind the barn and I actually found the two graves of the people who built it they died in like 1817 or 1813 something like that and uh they're the cabin's pretty much all original except for a few things that were added on, which is like a small room upstairs, which, which is where I was staying. And uh, um, it was definitely an interesting place to live. It had a lot of dark energy. And at the time, I was going through a lot of depression myself. I had recently been started getting diagnosed with, you know, disorders like bipolar and such like that. Um, when my grandma passed away, I was really, really close with her. So it really affected me a lot. So it kind of like think subconsciously I might have um you know invited some dark energy into my life or something and I kept seeing out of the corner of my eye like this like shadow man type being and um uh-huh. anybody who follows my channel knows I'm obsessed with these shadow man stories um, oh yeah um I I honestly have seen them so many times in my life I'm just like there's something here I want to know about these stupid shadow people um but I just kept seeing them and I was like yeah hey, like it was weird because it was like a bowler hat, if you know what I mean. But like at the same time, it was more squared. It wasn't like a top hat, but it it was I don't know. It was it was just like a weird time period hat. Like I haven't been able to find one exactly to it, but I found a lot of very similar ones in the early 1800s. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe he, it could be the one of the people who lived in that house. But um, I would see him at the top of the stairs all the time when I'd walk by. I'd corner my eye and I'd look up, and nobody would be there. But uh, sometimes you'd also hear this creaking going up those stairs. These stairs are the loudest things possible. Um, one day, my little brother walks down the hall. He walks past it, um, the doorway into the kitchen, and I come right behind him. And um, he's like, how'd you get down the stairs so fast? And I was like, what are you talking about? I was literally right behind you. Um, and there's, like I said, there's no way you could sneak down these stairs without them creaking. They're old. Like, it's just, it doesn't sound good at all. And it sounds like the house is about to fall apart, to be honest. And... Uh, um, he's like, well, I saw somebody standing at the top of the steps, and that's when it kind of confirmed Ooh. me. I was like, yeah, there's definitely something more going on than me just seeing something out of the corner of my eye. Wow. And um, leading to that, I tried to sleep. I've only slept in that room like a handful of times because, you know, heat rises. There's no AC up there, so right, it sucks right. up in the summer. So I'll be sleeping in the, the living room a lot. But there's also just like a, an ominous feeling in there. I just always felt like somebody 
really was pissed off that you were there. It just felt really oppressing. It just was, and it, but one time I slept there, I just had this nightmare that there was this shadow dude standing at the end of my bed the entire time, just staring at me. And um, one time that I slept in there, uh, a meth head tried to kill me. So that's cool. Wait, well, well, okay, hold on. Whoa, now I gotta <laughs> ask like, about this I... meth head story. <laughs> it's like, it's like throw that in there real quick. Okay. No, uh, in that same room. It's like one of the last experiences I actually had in that room. So I'm like crazy okay. meth person broke into our uh, our cabin in the middle of nowhere and was like really? had, had our knife and everything and i was like i woke up and she's just there and i was like oh all right <laughs> so, <laughs> so how, how did you handle like that. that honestly i repress everything it's probably not healthy okay <laughs> <laughs> that's how i handle that so i i got i mean were you like okay listen dude Okay, you're clearly on some. What, what's going on? Why are you here? <laughs> oh, I, I honestly don't even remember what they did. I, I let everybody else deal with that and went back to bed. <laughs> meth head breaks into your house with a knife. And you're like, fam, yo, fam, uh, we got a meth head in the house. Can you deal with them? I'm going to go back to bed. <laughs> what the hell was I going to do, dude? <laughs> like, like 14 years old. That was like, what, what I don't, 15, oh, I think. I so you were pretty I young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, like, I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. And it's like, oh jeez. Like, I think, like, <laughs> I think if I was in those shoes, uh, I would have flipped. I would have been like, "Yo, fam, get the shotgun!" <laughs> Just watch how fast they run. Oh, I'm also geez. from Florida, though, so I'm pretty. Uh, yeah. I'm used to the crazy, drugged-out people. Bro, to be honest, so many in Florida. Why is it Florida? Like, you don't hear about it that bad in, you know, California, or like. Colorado or Oregon. No, it's all in Florida. What? I think uh, Florida gets an unfair rap because it's like, there's like Florida man. It's like, and you look into it, they're not even from Florida. It's like, this is bullshit. You know, but it's like, <laughs> um, honestly, bullshit. everywhere's got their, their drug problem. Obviously, oh, yeah. But uh, some places are just going to be, you know, more glamorized than others because of the memes and all that. So, oh, yeah, definitely. But, um, yeah, there's bad. It's bad everywhere. Like when I was living in Knoxville, there was like really bad, like heroin and stuff like that. When I was Ooh. in Asheville. North Carolina, it was really bad. Salvia, um, jeez, you know, Florida is really bad with the meth. You know, like every oh, yeah. state kind of has its, its real bad problem. I'd say, um, it's it's unfortunate. So you know, on the subject of Shadow Man, I'm sorry to backtrack here a little bit, but on the subject of, of Shadow Man, I actually have a story I have not told anybody. Would you want to hear it? Yeah, dude, I'd love to hear that. All right, so I grew up in a place called Bethel, Vermont. It's a very small town in like the heart of vermont all right and the house i lived in had two parts the original part was a farmhouse and it was built in the 1850s for the um, allen family and then in the 70s i think 70s 80s the landlord i had built an extension onto it and uh you know so he had on a garage and another kitchen another attic and whatnot uh, a more accessible attic. The original attic was just kind of a, um, a insulation attic, so like there was no like flooring. It was just for putting in insulation. And the thing about this house is, it had, it had a huge backyard. All right, it had a huge backyard, and you know there were it was a whole mountain. Like he owned the mountain behind the house as well as the yard it connected to, mm. and. At night, I would I would not go outside at night if I could help it, because I would look out the windows and I would see people, shadow people running between the trees. Like they'd they'd run from behind one tree over to another and just stop and just disappear, or I'd see them out in the field just standing there, like staring towards the house, or you know running around just causing them, uh, you know just having fun with each other or something. Like they would just be out there like I don't know almost playing. And you could see it plain as day in the dark, like because they were just darker than the pitch black night. You know, you know what I mean. Like they are such a color of dark that they just stand out. Mm-hmm. You know, and if we turn on the lights, you'd see them in the lights because they would run through the light for fun. Like they would come out of the darkness, run through the light, go back into the darkness, and then you'd see another one. And it was quite interesting to see what happened. Um, but one night. I had some friends over. I was a bit older. It was probably around 15, 16 at that time. And we decided, let's go play hide and seek outside in the dark in the backyard that has a cornfield attached to it. Now, the cornfield was down. It wasn't that time of year for the corn to grow. But it was pretty much just a hay field 
at that point. There was a, it was a cornfield and a hay field and then our yard, okay? And so one night, there that night, we were all playing, and there's only three of us in this huge backyard. So it's pretty much impossible to find anybody without, like, some kind of noise or hint. But I yeah. decided I'm going to go in the hay field and, like, really hide. And so I go in the hay field, and I lay down on my stomach. And so the grass is too high for them to find me. And I'm laying there, and I can, and I, I'm, like, at the edge. So I can, like, peer through the grass and see them looking for me. And they all found each other, but they're still looking for me. And then I think I was pretty sure there was only three of us, or four of us in total. I mean, I'm sorry. There was four of us. There was me, my brother, and our two friends. And I was pretty sure I was watching. I was seeing all three. Um, and so I'm looking at all three, and they're all just talking, looking around in the bushes, trying to find me. They can't find me. And then I hear someone coming up from behind. And I hear the shh of them walking through the gla uh, grass. And... I feel the grass at the end of my feet being pushed down. And I look, and there is a tall shadow person right there at my feet. So I I had enough. I got up, and I, I ran. Uh, I gasped, I jumped, and I ran. And I just run straight to them. And they're like, what, what's going on? What, what, what happened? And I'm like... There is a man in shadow. <laughs> so I said, there is a man in shadow over in that field. They came up right behind me. They touched my feet. And we all just went inside at that point. Now, they didn't see as much activity because my brother didn't live with us. And those friends only came over occasionally. But I, who lived there all the time, would look out in the backyard and just see them running around. And um, as I got older... I noticed that it happened progressively less. I think I became more numb to it, so it didn't really, like, it didn't stand out as much. But occasionally, like, around my house, or if I'm, like, out somewhere I don't know, I'll see shadow men just chilling about. They seem rather harmless, don't they? Sometimes. I've had some more nefarious things happen, and uh, obviously I've been sent thousands of stories about them. Like, I definitely think there's kind of a uh, in-between uh, one of my first interviews is with uh, uh, a friend of mine who has passed away, uh, Kevin Malick, who is a very uh, big researcher into this kind of stuff. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. to hear that, though. Just sorry, man. Yeah, rest in peace to Kevin. He's a great guy. Um, he would always he always had a, a belief that they were more of like people in, of the in between, like spirits, kind of spirits and trans or trans dimensional or interdimensional. Uh, beings kind of going through our dimension and uh, kind of just coming through and passing through. That's why they were shadows. That's why he was kind of more under the belief of. And um, there's many other beliefs. Obviously, there's the old school demonology way where uh, they just think everything are demons. So they could be demons or it could be, you know, lost souls that died so traumatically and so suddenly that they don't even know. So this is where they are. They're kind of in that purgatory. There's so many different ideas and, you know, uh, things what they could be so I, I think it's a mix of all three though I think it could be because you know sometimes the stories are evil and you know maybe that's a demon or maybe that's some sort of dark energy that's just manifesting itself in a way that they know is gonna conduct the fear that they feed off of or whatever it may be you know so what has it been like for you to like you know knowing that these things are everywhere you know does, does it ever ch has it ever changed your perspective on like how you look at places and different things no, no, because like I said, I'm a hard skeptic. <laughs> I'm a hard skeptic. Even after all my experiences, like I said, we could sit here for hours. I could tell you so many ghost hunting stories, scary stories, you know, things I've seen, uh, things I've heard, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, can't prove any of it. Can't explain any of it. That's true. Can't even remotely, you know, be fucked to try to make people believe it. So, like, for me, it's more of just, like, you know, these are some, you know, the earth is a weird place. You know, it's a really weird place. If you look at nature, there's some weird stuff going on in nature. And if you just kind of look at how, you know, life is in general, there's a lot of weird stuff going on out there. So um, personally, I think I just I just have to be a, a skeptic ultimately. But I think I don't think it's really changed how I live my day to day life or perceive things too much. I've kind of been the same person since a young child, to be honest. Like, as weird as that sounds, like, from the age of seven is when I can really remember being conscious. Yeah. Um, and, like, saying, like, saying beliefs that I still say to this day. 
um, and stuff like that. Um, so like, to me, I feel like at an early age, I kind of ex- started experiencing these things from, you know, traumas and whatnot that I had to go through mm. um, growing up the way I did. And um, I feel like the only thing it may have changed is, is for me is to be more respectful of my time on earth, you know, be more um, appreciative, you know, more appreciative, don't expect anything, just, you know, enjoy every second you have. And whenever that day comes that I'm going to have to cross, you know, into the next life, whether there is um, a God and early gates or whether I'm going to be struck down and have to burn for eternity or whether we just simply die, that's what we're going to have to come to that bridge. And I I just think the only thing I've learned is that I don't want to spend my time worrying about that now when I could be spending this time enjoying myself, my family, and, you know, the others that were so blessed to be around. So I got to ask, how old are you? I am 25. Oh, man, we're the same age. I I wouldn't have even believed it. Um, You know, it's funny. I I feel like I'm listening to a carbon copy of myself because even though I've experienced a lot of strange things that I cannot explain. You know, that house I was just telling you about, it was haunted. Like, there was there was some really weird stuff going on there. And, and I can say it was haunted, but at the same token, even experiencing stuff now with my son, because um, he's got a ghost that resides in his room. And I'm not sure if it's the person that died here a while ago, uh, before we moved in, or if it's uh, my wife's brother-in-law who unfortunately passed away a few years ago or if it's someone in my life that passed away all i know is it's there and it makes itself known but um even with all this stuff seeing this stuff experiencing this stuff i'm still very skeptical because i'm still questioning it like what if it's just something i'm seeing that's not actually there what if it's trauma based what if it's you know some form of ptsd you know what if I moved this object and I'm just legitimately forgetting I did, you know? And unless we have some kind of new technology that is specifically designed to pick up on ghosts and shadow men and cryptids, you know, and, and different kinds of spirits, we're never going to know. And because science is very much based off theory and practice, the problem with ghosts is it's all theory even if you experience it daily in your life you ask a scientist to try to debunk it they'll find a way to debunk it yes but it may not be thorough but again it's all theory so even if they can't debunk it they still have to come up with some kind of theory and then once they've come up with a theory they have to find a way to put it into practice but when we're talking about spirits there's no way to put any of it into practice so they can't specifically design something for the capture of ghosts or spirits and that's a problem is that we we legitimately cannot design anything like that yet we don't have the technology we don't have the know-how um i also think the other problem is is that we don't put enough scientists developers designers um engineers they don't put enough thought into how could we capture ghosts because again it's all just considered myth and legend but what do you I also, think? I think it might also come down to other things like just, you know, they're doing a lot of disclosures now with UFOs and stuff right, like that right. and, you know, whatnot. And they're they're trying to, I guess, push, you know, life outside of Earth more and whatnot. So a logical step would be to obviously disclose some sort of paranormal afterlife, you know, underworld, whatever you want to call it kind of, you know, thing. But to me, I think there's just so much more harm it does than good, and that's why a lot of time hasn't been put into it, simply because once you know what happens after death, the the human mystery, the human motivation, stuff like that kind of fades away and will cause a mass panic and chaos. And two, it kind of debunks, uh, in a sense, it kind of debunks a lot of religion. It does. And that's a problem. That's a problem in the world. It is. So that's why a lot of things don't change the way they should, even though it's very obvious, because the world unfortunately runs on money and power. And unfortunately, these are things that generate a lot of money and, and con- subsequently, you know, draw in a lot of power. So, that's fair. 
Um, and I also think I kind of feel like I also agree with you on the motivation. I feel like if people knew that there was an afterlife and that no matter what you did on this planet, that when you die, you become a ghost and you either live on this planet some more in another kind of world similar to Earth, uh, I think it would get rid of a lot of the human motivation to aim as high as some of us do. I think a lot of humans would just be like, well, what's the point? Like, what is the point of going to work every day? What is the point of making money? What is the point of trying if when we die, we get, we're get we free anyway? You know? And I so I agree with you on that. And it was just to mainly expand on your point a little bit more. But you're right. If they did release some kind of evidence that they may have gathered that, you know, d that would debunk religion, a lot of the world would crumble. Um, which yeah, is also why they probably took a lot of time to even debunk the fact that they know that ufos are real and that they know they don't know who drives them they don't know who's piloting these ufos and they know that they're they admitted that they're coming from you know likely other planets because there's no technology on our planet currently that we can develop that could even match the speeds or the aerial ability of ufos and oh, yeah they, you know it's great that they finally came out and said yeah you guys are you guys are right we we've all been seeing this since the 40s and 50s and i mean even before then the 1800s you had paintings that proved that they were seeing it then too you guys were right we just had to hide it but with them oh, debunk yeah, with them releasing this information it it's also pretty dangerous because the thought of life on other planets is now increased you know people are like well you just told us that ufos are real when are you going to tell us aliens are real when are you going to tell us more and that gets that that gets tricky because you tell people that we're not the only creatures in the universe. That, again, debunks a lot of religion, a lot of what we thought for many, many thousands of years. And that, even just releasing the information to UFOs, the world went crazy. Like, the world went crazy for a few weeks after the U.S. Navy was like, yeah, UFOs are real, here's all the evidence we have. No, we cannot drive them. No, we do not have any technology that can match their speeds or their aerial ability. No, they're not developed by us. And no, they're not driven by anyone on this planet. So we don't know anything about them. We just know that they're here and that they come and they go as they please. Or so they say. Or so they say. <laughs> there's there's so many interesting reports. I was, wa I was watching some really weird stuff where uh, there, there's been talks of apparently the American government working with like two separate species of aliens since like the 40s. And it's like, yeah. well, it like, who knows what's real? It's all crazy. It's all conspiracy. But hey, I, I wouldn't, as I always say, even though I'm a hard skeptic, I wouldn't be surprised. No. So I would not be surprised. I mean, very clearly we're not the only life out there in this ever expanding universe, allegedly anyway. Well, so, I mean... I mean there's been a lot of proof that we can't be the only ones on this uh, on this in this universe. I mean, I mean, there's been life discovered on Mars multiple times, and somehow it's just well hidden. Are still out here. It's not even really hidden. That's the thing. It's like they found what mummified trees. They found water sources. They found bacteria. They, well, they found yeah. all kinds. Of stuff. They, they found life. different forms of life. Yeah, but the, when we're talking about like humanic forms, you know, like uh, oh, it all, we all came from something, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, we, we had to. I was on a rock. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, science yeah, tells I mean, us that we came from organisms, but what if? So but what if there was a, another hand in that kind of growth? Like, no, oh, definitely. If we, if there are planet life on other planets that have developed the technology to be able to create spacecraft that can travel light years and billions of light years from planet to planet in the matter of minutes or hours. Like, who's to say that they could not have come to this Earth at some point in the past and been like, all right. We are going to create our own species and see how they do on this planet. You know, the, you know some Anunnaki crap, like yeah. <laughs> get, get some ancient aliens, bro. <laughs> yeah, I was watching that show a couple weeks ago again, and I was just like, man, these people are crazy, but they make so much sense. They do, like they do sound crazy, but they make sense. And like the ancient alien show, there's some a lot of, of it. Oh, some of it. Yeah, some, some of it. it. Some of it. Some yeah. of it's just that shit crazy, to be honest. There's yes. a few things I'm like, no, okay, no, you're going too far with this one, man. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are some theories on the ancient alien show that are a little just as out of this world as the people they're trying to talk, as the creatures they're trying to talk about. I mean, some of their theories don't really match up well, but they try hard. Got to give them credit. They, they do. do try pretty hard. 
Uh, they do definitely make a lot of sense for some things, though. It's oh, like, yeah. man, that does make sense. Now, if that were a thing, you know, that would definitely... I mean, there's a lot of things, like, if you try to use common sense and piece together things, and at least the common sense that humanity has created, um, you can make things make sense in a human way, you know what I mean? But oh, that, yeah. like, that's that's what... See, I've been painfully aware of this since I was a child, Same like here. I said earlier. So, like everything is perception and everything is man-made so it's like when people are like well it takes this many miles to get here i'm like does it though because do those numbers actually mean anything like i'm like i'm one of those i'm one of those freaking people i'm like so like how do we actually know that what we're not doing is just something part of this human understanding and you know we have to make it make sense for us but how do we know that's actually what's happening yeah like um you know just to kind of go a little out of this world with it what if like there was an alien species and they came down to earth and we were like, and we explained to them, well, if we, if you drive 60 minutes at, or an hour at 60 miles per hour, you go, you know, 60 miles. And they're like, no, 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 that's not 60 miles. That's this amount with this kind of number base. And it's like, oh, oh, you know, it, it kind of destroys the thought of man-made perception. Because yeah. everything on this planet we designed for ourselves. We designed so we can understand better and have a good idea of what we are doing. But then, you know, you bring in another species that has been on multiple planets for many, 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 many more years than us. You know, you bring them here and they're like, they, they look at us like, well, you know, I mean, they built a great system for themselves, but it, it makes no sense in the larger picture of things, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Something that um, I've always thought about, too, is, um, one, like, I-, I do kind of agree with a lot of the scientists. Like, space travel makes no sense. Like, I don't think there's any civilization that would, like, realistically be space traveling, you know, from, you know, this galaxy to another. That just would, that's just ridiculous. What I do think they're doing, which we have, we do have proof. I mean, CERN's a thing, guys. So what I do think is happening is interdimensional travel, though. I do think that makes a lot more sense than them like traveling billions and billions of light years and all that. Like it, it, that doesn't make sense to me. But like in the great in the greater scheme of things, like you said, like everything is kind of like built for humanity to succeed and to understand the world. But wh- where does that actually like where do, when does human perception start and stop? And that's where like society is. Like everybody's like a society's you know they say it's fucked and like it is. But like it's this way by design, so right, right. It's, it's like it's the same. Uh, that's that's why I think the same thing about you know our perceptions of life and science and everything. Sometimes why I stay the open skeptic because like really we what do we know anything? Like do we like all we all we know is what we're told? You know what I mean? Right. And history is written by the victor, and that's all I need to know. Um, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with ancient Rome. I was obsessed with World War II. I actually wanted to join the army because I was so enthralled with World War II and like my grandparents and great grandparents and all them. And I was like so like just awestruck by the heroism and all that. And then I look more into it. I, I study more into it, and I see more things, and I find out a lot of more, you know, dark things that you would never know because obviously it's America. It's the greatest country, right? And then. You learn as a kid that like history is literally written by who whoever wins, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a good like a good example is like the Civil War. You know, I come from a place where everybody's demonized because they're racist by design, you know, by birth because we lost the Civil War. So it's right. kind of like the same thing. So like that's kind of like there's all these things that like changed my perception as a kid that made me be this skeptic no matter how many times I experience or see weird things. Like I said, I will attest and say that they are real. Just like you said, I lived in a haunted freaking house. That place was haunted as hell. Mm-hmm. Shit moved all the damn time. Oh, you know, yeah. like I've lived in more than one haunted house. I moved a lot as a kid. So I lived in a lot of old places, a lot right. of creepy places. And, you know, I know what I know, but I'm not going to say that I know because I still don't know. You know what I mean? I know what I, <laughs> I know what you're saying. I guess, but I, I know what I experienced, but I don't know what the hell I experienced at the same time. Right, right. Like, you know what you experienced. You know that it doesn't make any real sense, and you know there's no way to prove what you experienced, but you know what you experienced was real. Yeah, definitely. Like, it it happened. It definitely was a thing, but I'm not one of those people that are trying to make anybody believe anything because it's just a waste of my time, you know? I mean, people are going to either believe or not believe, no matter what you tell them. Yeah, exactly. It's Um, like, and that's your choice, and that's why I, like, 
I like I built my channel on you know just these are stories. I don't have the true in the titles. I don't I don't you know try to force that on anybody because it's like at the end of the day they're stories. You know I can only prove these so far. You know, uh, right. it, it is what it is. It's here for entertainment ultimately. But I mean, if there is truth behind the story, then that's great. You know, and it is. But you can't pass it off as being true unless you experienced it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like it's just like I normally will say it's 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 to the author. You know what I mean? Like it's it's true to them because they're the ones who experienced it. They know right. their truth. And sure, I'm sure plenty of stories are creative writing projects written up and sent in. You know, I'm not one of those people that blindly says like, oh, these all these stories are true. I only read true stories. I read stories that are entertaining. It's yeah. kind of as simple as that. So, um, well, you know, back on the subject of uh, of our haunted houses when we grew up. Most of the places I lived were haunted in some way, shape, or form, whether it was like that before I moved in or whether it was something that followed me into there. Um, one place that I lived in was an apartment complex in uh, Randolph, Vermont. And, you know, the houses themselves weren't haunted except for one. And it only became haunted recently at that time because there was an old man that lived downstairs in the downstairs apartment, right? And he had one of those um, automated wheelchairs because he was, you know, he was really old. And he was a great guy. His name was Dicky, And he was an amazing, amazing man. I believe his name was Dicky. I could be wrong. It was, it was a long time ago. My memory's been messed up since then. Um, but, you know, none of those places were haunted. Except for the place he lived in. And it only started after he passed away because you would, the place was empty for a while before anyone moved in. And people, the the smokers, the people who smoke cigarettes would go outside and they would say that they'd look in and they would see this the, the man that used to live there riding on his automated wheelchair throughout the rooms, through the window, even though he was long gone. And then one night, um, because of the way the complexes were designed, it was like um, four apartments in one building and then four apartments in the other building that were connected by a little like a sidewalk because they were right next to each other, right? And we lived on the side that had the uh, that apartment on it. And we I'd go outside because my ex-girlfriend lived in the apartments next to us. And um her house was literally the one that was across from that old man's former place. And one night I went down there to go into the ha- into their place um to visit. And I looked in the window just out of curiosity because I hadn't seen one of those apartments when they were empty before. And, you know, I go up to the window and I put my hand, I cut my hands, you know, around my eyes so you can see in better without all the light glare, right? And I look in and he's just, that old man that passed away is just sitting in his chair. Like, he's not staring at me or nothing. He's just like staring at the door. But he's just sitting there in his automated chair and then he just moves his hand and he goes into one of the rooms. Nothing moves. The door didn't shut or anything on its own, but I, he's dead. I knew he's dead. I was there when he passed away. Well, I wasn't there, but, like, I saw the the day the ambulance arrived to, you know, take his body. But, like, it was just weird. Um, and, again, that's just one of those stories that even though I saw it and many others saw it, you go and tell anybody else, and they're like, oh, you just saw something. It was just, it wasn't there, you know. But how about you? Like, what's the scariest experience you ever had in one of the houses you grew up in? Um, I'm just curious. Hmm. Oh, I'm trying to think. There's a pretty, there's a few intense ones. I learned quickly on in my life not to really mess with the paranormal. Um, I I used to be like really big into ghost hunting shows when I was younger, and mm-hmm. uh, I had a small experience that wasn't anything really worth sharing, that um like made me not want to mess with ghosts or really do anything. Uh, I did a few ghost hunting things when I was a teenager to mess around, but um. I'd probably say the scariest one, the most intense one, the one that really like, like stuck out to me, stuck out to me the most, where I was like, God damn, this is intense, was um, I was at my dad's house. It was not long after my grandmother passed, and uh, for some reason there was like this dark mist that would just sit in the top of the corner of my room, right above my door, and it was like so noticeable that even like my friends and parents would say something about it. Ooh. And um, it was just weird. It was just this dark mist, and uh, it would just stay there. Not nothing. It would just be like this ominous, kind of depressing anxiety, you know, kind of just filled like energy in the room. And um, 
I remember things started slowly, like it just was that, and then like things would move off my desk, like a like a toy car flew across the the room and pegged against the wall, um, table like uh, excuse me, a pens, uh, papers, stuff would fly off the desk and stuff like that. Um, my dog would just sit there and stare at the uh, the corner and growl at it sometimes, and uh, just weird stuff like that. And then one day, it just kind of came to a head to where like it just like was like my whole roof was just like covered in this mist one day Ooh. and no even when i turned the light on the windows open it was just there and it was just like a super super depressing feeling and suddenly um so like my desk at the time that my parents had in my room was like this really massive like wood one like it, it almost looks like an armoire and it was just like this massive and this whole thing just came falling down on top of me um, I was fine. I ended up being okay because I'm, I'm a quick guy. And I'm a small boy, so I was able to squeeze through things and yeah. uh, be okay. But um, yeah, that's probably the most intense thing because that's the only time like something tried to like hurt me. So like nothing's like I've never had like scratches that I know of anyway. I've never had like you know bruises or anything like that that I know of. Obviously, I never felt like I was attacked or anything outside. Of maybe some sleep paralysis here or there. Maybe seeing uh -huh. some creepy maybe having something rush me something like Ooh. that but like i don't really remember ever really having anything try to hurt me outside of that i said it could really? be anything I never know maybe the desk just fell over yeah I mean, maybe <laughs> but that's still kind of you know creepy <laughs> you know what i mean like maybe the desk was just you know what miss this kid's day <laughs> the desk just grew a mind for like a split second just to try to end your life it woke up and chose violence. <laughs> Wake up every day choosing violence, huh? That desk. Um, but that's still creepy, though. I mean, those are some creepy stories. I cannot deny that. It's pretty, pretty messed up. Um, you know, I, I got a pretty creepy story for you. Um, I'll make it quick, though, just because we both told a lot of stories here today. But uh, one night, I was getting my son to try to go to sleep. It was late. Um, he had already gone to sleep and put him in his crib and we started making dinner and then he woke up just kind of suddenly and so I'm like rocking him I made him a bottle I take him into his room and because his room is connected to the kitchen um, and my wife was cooking dinner because I was trying to get him to sleep so uh, I just took him in his room and I'm trying to rock him the doors open and it's not working because he's you know the, the sounds from the kitchen were just kind of keeping him up and distracted so I got up with him in my arms I shut the door and then uh, I'm in the rocking chair and I'm rocking back and forth. I'm trying to feed him a bottle. He doesn't want the bottle, so I pick him up and I put the bottle down and uh, I just put him over my shoulder. And I start staring off into the corner of the room when all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, like something grows. This this human shaped shadow just grows up out of the floor and doesn't move. I don't move. Um, and I wasn't scared in the moment. I was more just, like, protective of my son. Like, what is this thing that just appeared in the, in the corner of the room? Just, you know, out of nowhere. And so I'm just kind of staring at it, like, with a very protective look on my face. And, a, and an intensity that I had never felt before. And I'm just staring at it. Just staring. And this thing is just standing there, staring back at me. And it must have been, like, ten minutes. I'm not even joking. It was probably, like, ten minutes. Of just me and this thing staring at each other. And then my cat opens the door. The light hits it. It disappears. Um, so because the cat woke him, the cat woke up my son when he did when it did that. So I get up and I shoot the cat out of the room. And I shut the door again. Sit back down. And this thing just reappears. And so for five more minutes we're just sitting there staring at each other. And I the cat opened the door again. And I had enough. I didn't want to deal with it anymore. So I just took him out to the living room. And uh, just tried out there. He started falling asleep. Which is good. But... It was just a weird, weird situation. Um, yeah, dude, that's definitely weird. I mean, it kind of reminds me, uh, I guess I'll share one more story real quick. Sweet. Uh, when I was living in that cabin I talked about earlier, one night we were playing, me and my uh, older half-brother and older stepbrother were playing Manhunt, and for those who don't know, it's basically just kind of more intense version of hide-and-seek in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were doing it inside because we lived in the middle of nowhere and it's pitch black out there and, you know, mountain lions, coyotes, all that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's trying to mess with all that. Right. Um, so we're playing inside. Um, it quickly gets boring because we live in a small cabin. And uh, okay. so what I decided to do is I climb up my window in my room, which goes right onto the roof. And 
Uh, just for some context real quick, we had a metal roof. This will come in play a little bit later. Um, so I climb up there. I'm waiting there for probably five, ten minutes. You know, obviously they're probably pissed off they can't find me. Um, and I, at the time I didn't really realize what was happening, but suddenly all the cicadas and all the crickets in the area just suddenly went quiet. Whoa. And it was, just, it, was uh, it was one of those nights where... Um, I think it was it was like fall time. I, I think it was around August. It was definitely late summer, and uh, just about to get cold, starting to fall, come into the fall days. And it was like a cool, crisp night, just a slight breeze. It was probably like so like high 60s, mid 60s, with a little breeze. It was really nice. And I remember just sitting there and kind of suddenly realizing how freaking quiet it was. And out of nowhere, I hear like this like thud like something lands on the other side of the roof Ooh. and i'm like and at the time um this roof there's no way anything can land on the roof without me seeing it um i like the roof is not like this it, it's a cabin you know what i mean it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not like you can't really miss what's happening so i'm looking around and i literally see nothing so i'm like okay maybe something just fell i don't know and then i hear a few footsteps and i'm like oh hell no so uh what i quickly do is i kind of shimmy my way down to my window get back in there and uh, my two brothers come up and they're like you know what the hell bro you, you screwed us you're not supposed to do that that's not that's against the rules and i was like yeah but besides that there's some spooky stuff out here let's check that out right quick so um me and my uh older brother my older stepbrother he's the oldest one he was probably like 18 maybe 20 at the time maybe okay um and uh so he goes up there he's a big guy he's like six five six four two three hundred pounds something like that big guy and um we get up there together and we're just standing there in the middle of the roof and it's all quiet it's just the wind it picks up a little bit at this time and uh, i just remember i i I'm, as i sit here i could hear the, the the noise of the wind in my ears and it's such a strange experience like we're calling these things and i just remember it was dead ass quiet it felt like it was the middle of the winter that's how quiet it was and like with the wind it was like just such a weird vibe going on and then suddenly again there's like a big thud and what sounds like step like foot like it sounds like hooves to be honest running towards us Whoa. we're standing there in the middle of the thing there's nothing there we can't see a damn thing like i'm looking all around us and this thing starts circling us running around us probably does it about five or six times i put my arm out and i feel like this cold sensation but i don't feel anything physically you know what i mean like there's yeah. nothing like there's no there's nothing you know it's just cold as hell and you can feel the wind and you can f actually hear the footsteps and then when you look down you can kind of see the indentations a little bit so like there's like something there but you can't feel it and it runs around us a few times and then suddenly it runs all the way to the other end of the thing again it seems like it takes off you know the root like jumps off the roof or whatever and as short and sweet as that was it's just an experience that i can't even fathom or give an explanation to because it's like what the f what the hell was that you know wow like, i don't even know what's and th this is like a flat roof like this is a flat roof cabin um kind of like it, it does have a it has a sort of v to it but at the same time it's not like you know it's not like a it's kind of flat, but it's not the same time. It's kind of in between, I'd say. Okay, so it's so it's kind of like um, kind of like a half flat, where it's got a little bit of a point just to keep like rain and whatnot from puddling, yeah. but not enough where it's not walkable. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very okay. easy to walk up there, but to run like this thing was running, it would be honestly impossible for a human being without slipping and falling. Okay, all right, I see what you're saying. And like, you didn't see anything. It was just kind of like you you heard it, you felt it, but like there was no like physical. Um, uh, no, nothing at all. Absolutely Whoa. nothing. It was the noise was loud as day. Um, the imp, the indentations were as heavy as if there was something there, and um, the feeling of dread was incredibly strong. There were there were no you know smells associated with it. There was no physical feeling. There was no like there was nothing tangible going on. But you wow. could hear it, see it. You could feel the coldness. You know, you could definitely feel that there was something running around you like you could feel like the breeze coming off of something as if it were running around you but like there was apps like i said absolutely nothing and, and did you um, like look like the next day when it, you know when the sun was out to like see if there were any marks or anything left 
Um, I went up there a ton of times after that, as I, I loved. I just like to hang out up there. Um, yeah. But I've never noticed any, you know, scratches Whoa. or invitations, nothing. But Bro. I do remember seeing the the. They said it's a metal roof, but it's not the kind of roof that like goes in when you step on it. You know what I mean? It's not a weak roof. It's a, right. it's a solid piece of piece of metal. So I do remember distinctly seeing like what what I could only describe as hooves look like imprinting into it. Whoa. Like I would probably say like ram's hooves, something like that, like a goat. Um, and that That's... wouldn't make that wouldn't I don't know, like I but it could be I'm not saying it's goat man or anything. Like I said I didn't see anything. Right. So I don't know what the <laughs> hell it is. But it was just one of those experiences that like it was like affirmation for me. It was like there is some weird whatever going on out here and uh some areas just have some really strong energies inside and out it doesn't even have to be a house you yeah. know um this area has indian burial grounds less than a mile away from that house there's oh, wow. a, a, a world war ii not world war ii excuse me a, a famous civil war battleground um less than a, a quarter of a mile from the house um i said there's there's graves all over the place from the farmers and the people who have worked the lands over the generations there's family cemeteries there's you know you so, so your heart so this cabin was like in the middle of like like the most spiritual kind of places and historic oh, places yeah. it could be oh it man. high energy it was high energy like in the foothills of the uh, smoky mountains there so and um, where was this this was um this is like 30 40 miles outside of a small town called maryville tennessee or as they saw it maryville maryville but, yeah okay i think uh, i think i know the area so, you're talking about yeah, it's East Tennessee. It's closest to closest city would be Knoxville. Oh Johnson wow, city, you know, that kind of area, um, like an hour away from Asheville, North Carolina, the, that area. So, okay. not like not terribly far, probably from where you you're situated at. Um, I'm situated in like near like North Myrtle Beach, so it'd be like eight hours at most, at most, depending on traffic. Um, but man, that is. That is crazy. Um, but what do you do now? Like, what what's your life like now that you're in Florida and you're you know you're a well known YouTuber in the horror community and whatnot? Like, you know, what's life like for you, man? Honestly, it's just busy, 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 busy. I um I try to make uh, videos every single day. I try to make multiple if it, if possible. I try to do weekly streams. Working on getting the second channel going up. Got more you know working on the podcast all the time got another podcast a couple more podcasts probably gonna start up this year got That's all kinds awesome. of stuff you know documentaries in the works more in-depth ones ones that you would probably see on netflix that kind of quality oh that's cool um, you know working on the website trying to get things more you know community based over there and try to get like things rolling over there more exclusive content stuff that doesn't fit on youtube anymore um, and just kind of just continuing to uh, build this little media company we got going over here in the swamp. It's kind of just slowly but surely expanding what we do and how we do it. And that's so exciting. It's going, you know. That's so exciting to to find out. You know, as a fan, as a longtime fan, I'm excited to see what kind of content you come up with. Now, I got I got to mention uh, with your podcasts that you're making. If you ever need a guest, hit me up. I would love to be a guest. Um, oh yeah, definitely. So, like, do you have, like, a lot of big plans coming up besides those, for, um, like, you know, video plans? Do you have anything, like, exciting that you want to mention? Um, nothing too much right now. I've got some mm. uh, streaming plans, but I'm not going to talk cool. about those until I actually, you know, have something solidified. Right. But right, I, uh, I got a, a small two-week vacation coming up in June, so that's oh, nice. That's exciting. You're going to spend a lot of time with the girl, my man? Oh yeah, definitely. Just try to completely detach from the internet for a while and uh, try to, uh, you know, recharge and come back feeling better than ever. Now, do you make like a decent living off of your YouTube account? I'm just curious. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I make enough. You know, this YouTube is what it is. You know, it's unreliable. You know, it could be yeah. better sometimes than others. But you know, the luckily the channel for the most part is uh, good enough to be able to maintain the content that we put out and. You know, continue to to do this on a daily basis for everybody. Let, let me ask a different thing. Do you have to work? Like, do you have to have a full time job or even part time? 
Um, no, simply because this is more of a business than just a YouTube channel. You know, okay. there's it's more of a media business. So, there's, so there's uh, more going on behind the scenes than what we're more aware of. Oh yeah, I mean, there's you guys have probably have seen things even on like Animal Planet that like I have been a part of like producing. Oh. So like I I like yeah, there's more going on. Like I'm not like rich or anything. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't want to like be like yeah, I'm this big YouTube flexer out here. No, it's it's the the swamp is fine. It does what it needs to do, and it's out here doing its thing. But um, this is my full time job. I fo I focus all my time on you know this company and trying to expand it and create more content. Because at the end of the day, my biggest dream was always just to be a radio host when I was a kid. I loved mm -hmm. you know whether even. <laughs> even more than the music dreams and the YouTube dreams and everything else that I have, I've come across in the years being a radio host, listening to radio and podcasts and stuff like that is like my, like is like my addiction. I love it. Um, I can sit there and listen to the AM, the FM, the podcast, whatever you want all day and really? uh, never be bored of it. I just love hearing people talk and I love converse, uh, com you know, having conversations and conversing with people. And, uh, there's just something about radio that's just magic to me. Um, I, think, I think it's so because that's, it's just so reliable. And it's so available and entertaining, no matter what. It's always there, you know. Even yeah. even in the apocalypse movies, you got that little radio station. So yeah, it's true. Something. You know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. My ultimate goal is just you know to try to ex keep expanding into that way. You know, YouTube is always you know main priority. It's the biggest one that we I, I've got going there. But I've, I'm always working on something. I'm always doing stuff. Like right now, I guess I can share. I'm, I'm working on a crawlers documentary with my good friend Carrick from the uh, Crash Course Cryptozoology uh, group, and we are uh, going real in-depth, connecting all kinds of things from the Fresno Nightcrawlers to the, you know, the crawlers from other places in the world, and oh, uh, as so well exciting. as uh, even trying to connect, like, Ashmen and, like, Wendigos and stuff like that together to piece together what people are seeing. Are they seeing the same thing? Are they seeing variations of the same thing? Or is this just some sort of phenomenon that's entirely unexplainable? Now, I don't know about every kind of cryptid, but what's an ash man? That sounds interesting. Um, it's very similar to what people would, you know, so uh, people talk about the rake all the time. That's not a real, like, cryptid. That's a creepypasta character that's kind right. of been, you know, that kind of got bastardized into being a cryptid. Yeah. But it's mainly confused with what a lot of natives would call an ash man which is just a very, what you ex exactly would expect to see, you know, a rake to look like a skinny humanoid that's very pale, looks almost, you know, inhuman. You know, if you've ever seen that, like, really famous thumbnail for the Russian sleep experiment, essentially, yeah. you know, something like that. You know, just like a really ugly human who's, you know, who would live in a cave, essentially. You know, what you would expect cave people to live in. Maybe, so it's essentially you know, like an emaciated, of... deformed-looking human. In a sense, yes. Yeah. That's what the, that's how the other goes. So, okay. um, but basically, you know, the same thing as what you've heard from crawlers and rakes and wendigos and everything else. You know, so me and Carrick have just kind of been talking for months. I was like, well, there's something more here. You know, what what is all this? Like, it kind of connects. It feels like because if you look at the timeline, it's kind of weird. Some of the things kind of feel like they go hand in hand, and it feels like you know people might be seeing something very similar. What do you believe? Personally, with um, I go into every one of these documentaries. We just finished the St. John's River one as well that I'm excited about. I go into all of these with absolutely no expectations, but I absolutely think that they're, you know, when it comes to mass amounts of people seeing, in my opinion, there's a grain of truth to every story. Now, where that grain of truth lies in that story could be anything from them just saying what their name is to the actual encounter itself. Okay. But where, when we can try to locate where that grain of truth is, we can find out where this story came from and why, why it happened and what happened. You have to dissect it. You have to, you know, kind of really look at it for what it is. And if you are in one, you know, if you are in one belief, like if you believe Bigfoot's real, you're probably going to see Bigfoot. You're if right. you believe that the rake is real, you're probably going to see big or the rake you know I, I've, I've had people say that they swear on their mother's grave which i honestly have had phone calls with people where they've like they sound so sincere that they've seen slender man is slender man real probably not but i believe in tulpas because to if you believe in something hard enough i believe you're going to see it whether that's placebo or that's a tulpa or whatever it is energy is a powerful thing but if you have a belief in something i feel like that skews the way you look at it and you can't come in with any expectations like i would love 
for their for these stories all to be real. I would absolutely be you know over the moon for those creepy night crawlers to be an absolute real piece of footage. But you know I can't go into it thinking that, or I'm gonna one have a I'm gonna have an incredibly biased viewpoint. I'm gonna be looking for things that aren't there, and I'm going to be doing my hardest to try to you know, throw away and explain away, you know, things that kind of prove against what we're looking for. So I, I feel like, you know, I don't, I have to go in completely blank and you're know, fair and unbiased mm-hmm. if I'm really going to, you know, find, you know, the actual story here. And that's what I'm here for is just to share the story, to archive it and to keep it alive for, you know, you and everybody else who is interested in this stuff for years to come. Now, uh, when it comes to the sighting, the video of the Fresno Nightcrawlers, you know, there's two weird you know two-legged no arm having looking creatures caught on camera mm-hmm. that night um what, what is your thoughts on that piece of footage because i'm sure you've seen it plenty of times oh yeah that's uh one of the pieces that we actually got a, a good copy of and we've um been really diligent on trying to contact the people and everything and uh honestly i just feel i feel like there's definitely something sketchy about that film um, the more I look at it, the more I hear the, the origin and everything. There's something sketchy about it for sure, but it does, even if it's not real, in in my opinion, I think it's very important because it opens up the discussion of uh, of a greater subject. And, and what would that uh, subject be? Um, that there are, there are weird things that happen out there. And there mm. are a lot of times that these things are kind of thrown away for no good reason. You know, if you look into a lot of police archives and backlogs and... Uh, things that like the CIA and the FBI and all that eventually declassify. There's a lot of weird ghost videos in there. There's a lot of paranormal encounters. There's a lot more than just the UFO stuff that they they have out there that they have declassified and have you know disclosed on. Though it leads to that greater discussion of life in general, like what life is. You know okay. where life comes from, where life goes. You know where'd you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? So <laughs> it's uh, if you. Uh, in my opinion, it just brings, even if these things are fake, it brings that bigger discussion of what happens when we die. Uh, why does that happen? Um, where do these creatures come from? Where do these sightings come from? Is it anxiety induced? Is it paranormal? Is this something from the government? Is it, is it an experiment? Or are we all just freaking psycho because we live in a crazy society? Um, well, okay. So I got, I guess I got just like one more like light question because I, you know, I am very interested in seeing declassified videos and whatnot from the government where would someone look for something like that honestly google is like the easiest thing um a lot of people like you gotta go on the deep web the the deep web doesn't really have anything you're not going to find on the surface web so uh like honestly just googling um i don't have any like specific websites off the top of my head i could i can definitely look back at some websites i've been looking into on some of these videos and send them your way please do but um Google honestly is been a big friend of mine. That's how I've you know initially started finding a lot of these things. And like I said, take everything with a grain of salt, you know. Right, right. You know, and don't don't just like blindly believe whatever you know. But I've there's definitely like, um, man, I'll send you a, a link. There's this interesting link of a couple of years back, probably like 2006 years or something, where they're even then are talking about the United States government having uh, interesting film and footage that they keep away for well, whatever reason. Probably not to scare the public. <laughs> if you think about it, that's why they hide a lot of what they do is because the government believes and I think someone knows that the public cannot handle a lot of what happens behind the scenes. A lot of the things that oh, don't yeah. don't happen at the surface because you have people that don't believe in anything and then you shatter that expectation, they go crazy. And then you have people who believe in everything and they're proven right so they go around being boastful and people go crazy people get hurt it's mass hysteria kind of like in ghostbusters you know mass hysteria um, oh yeah yeah it's, uh, it's definitely something that i think will slowly and eventually become more accepted and become a thing mm-hmm. but um you know whether it's our lifetime or not i think it might be but you know we'll see see how things do Oh, you know, if, if the Earth can survive that long, but uh, yeah. <laughs> exploding or imploding, you know, that would um, be great. I, I think if it's not in our lifetime, it's at least going to be in our children's lifetimes. Easy, oh, easy. Sure. Because with the way, with the rate of which this stuff is coming out, it's definitely going to be all out there by the time that they're 
our age or even a little bit older. You know, we get a handful more of some Elon Musk out there. I'm sure we'll have oh, ghosts and uh, aliens and all kinds of things. We'll probably have saber tooth tigers as pets in a couple of years. Who knows? Well, I mean, are they like trying to experiment on bringing that kind of DNA back into the world? Like they already have the DNA. Aren't they like trying to like uh, revive? Um, they're trying to revive a couple of bear species right now that that I was looking into, and they're trying to revive. Um, the uh god i think it's the scandinavian unicorn it's known as but it's this really big bison they so a rhino i think uh excuse me and it has like this massive horn and it's like a hairy rhino and uh, oh i know what a, you're talking about yeah. yeah 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 they're trying to bring that back there's a couple of things that they're, they're they're trying to bring back i don't know the success rate i don't really know where they're at but i've definitely seen some things about them trying to bring things back you know whether that's good or bad i don't know but as long as, long as it's not know. dinosaurs and we don't end up like jurassic park i'm okay with whatever they want to do <laughs> yeah, that's what we need is freaking t-rexes out here i mean t-rexes aren't actually that big though they're they're only they've only they've been proven that they're only probably like around like eight nine feet tall dude they're pretty small and like their running speed apparently from what they understand about the uh, the actual t-rex not the t-rex you see on jurassic park or whatnot apparently these things weren't very fast most humans apparently could outrun a, a t-rex believe it or not interesting and from what they understand of vocal cords that have been uh, preserved in amber apparently it's most likely the dinosaurs sounded more like a duck quacking than what you hear in you know jurassic park Believe oh, it or yeah, not, then they were covered, and they've already been proven that dinosaurs were covered in feathers. Like people don't, people believe that they're these scaly-looking creatures. No, no recent no, they, discoveries. They're big birds. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're big birds. Bird, basically. Oh yeah, and apparently, like most species that were not that were on land, not not water species, but most land species of dinosaurs, all types were covered in feathers. Um, yeah. Which is kind of interesting, because, I mean, you know, you look back in 2000, when Jurassic Park movies were, you know, insanely popular, the, the general consensus was that they were scaly creatures, and that they were these big, giant monsters. But it's only been in the past 20 years that they discovered, wait, T-Rexes are very small, can cannot outrun a human, and it sounded like ducks, and that, you know, our whole perception of what a dinosaur was was completely changed by discoveries oh, yeah. we had made. And it's kind of interesting, you know, how how big of a difference just uh, in, in knowledge of dinosaurs has changed in 20 years. So imagine the knowledge of things like aliens and ghosts and cryptids and, you know, even just any, some of the other unexplained mysteries of the world, like the like the 411 mystery, you know, disappearances in national parks. You know, imagine our knowledge on that in 20 years if people apply themselves to what's going on there or... You know, you have the Atlantic Triangle. You have the Bermuda Triangle. You have... You know, all these high-energy places that seem to just mess everything up. I mean, there's scientific explanations for a lot of that already. But, oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. When it comes to, like, the missing 401 thing, I think that's just more of, like, a mix of a lot of things going on. I, I don't agree. think there's one overall answer. I agree. I mean, if you... If you look at the maps of, like, you know, the, the U.S. caves and cavern systems, and you look at the maps of missing 401 missing people, oh, they overlap so heavily that it's, oh, they it's, do. it's actually it's really scary. And, I mean, I think a lot of it really does come down to just nature, the elements, unexpected things, weather. And, um, and then I do think there's obviously suicide, murder, that's obviously a part of it as well. And then oh, I do absolutely. think there's probably that percentage where, you know, maybe Bigfoot yoinked a, a freaking dude. Who knows? You yoinked know, maybe, a freaking dude. <laughs> maybe, you, know, you never know. You know, maybe he got yoinked. Yeah, maybe he got uh, yoinked. <laughs> um, no. You know, and, and like, you know, that, that kind of brings me to like one curiosity. We don't know everything that lives in the cave system of the world. You know, there are creatures down there that we are still discovering. Who's to oh, say yeah. that there isn't some kind of human, humanistic, humanoid-like, you know, creature down there that we don't know about yet? What if there are, you know, giant bugs or giant something down there that we don't know about yet and that takes humans as a food source? Because we don't know Definitely. every cave system in the world. The cave system goes to the core of the world, and we can't explore it all. It's impossible. So who knows what's in there? 
Oh, definitely. I mean, there's so many stories I've read of, like, cavers or, and spelunkers and all that, just finding, like, random human remains. Yeah. And, like, random, like, um, like from early humans, like, exploring in these caves, and they find, like, old, like, notebooks of, like, Spaniards and stuff, and they're talking about these monsters that are eating them and these things. Like, did they go crazy from deprivation, or is there actually a monster down here? What the hell? Right. Like, like so, uh, what do they, what do they experience? Things. And it makes you wonder, like... What in the world do we not know that it lives right below our feet? That's personally what I love about it the most, you know, and that's kind of why I have the viewpoint I have and why I'm not really too, you know, worried about, I guess, you know, if people believe or what, or being a 100% believer, you know, I, I'm happy being as, you know, an open skeptic because at the end of the day, it's just the, the wow factor, the, the absolute interest factor that these, these mysteries provide for people like me and you and uh, everybody else who is, uh, you know, either experienced something or just likes hearing these stories, you know? Oh, yeah. And, you know, even if a lot of this stuff was not real, it's still interesting to hear these stories. And I think yeah. that's why people love channels like yours and, like, Let's Read and, like, Mr. Creeps and, like, Demon Creeps and so many others. MCTs, Raven Reads, uh, 242, um, Lazy Masquerade, you know, because it's interesting to not only hear these stories, hear what's being written, but also by a voice that really drives home the story while also being entertaining to listen to. And I actually I got asked by someone, when are you, when, Matthew, when are you going to start narrations? And it's an interesting question because I want to, but I feel like I do not have the voice for being able to bring these stories to life. I believe I can do the range of voices that are needed for characters, but I don't believe I have the voice for an entire narration. That's more of just practice comes makes perfect, man. It's a muscle. You know, it's just like singing, scientifically proven. Anybody can sing if they practice enough. It's just oh, a yeah. muscle. So um, really, it's just, you know, you just got to keep doing it. When I first started, I literally whispered, man. <laughs> so, like, it was <laughs> terrible. So, like, um, like you honestly just kind of come into your voice, and eventually you'll get that confidence. And it's mainly just about having confidence in yourself and your ability. Um, a lot of people don't read out loud. So, like, when they're like, oh, I want to narrate, they don't realize how, like, it's not just reading a story at the end of the day. It's actually, like, putting on a performance. Oh, yeah, and, it's absolutely uh, putting on a performance. I'm sure everybody's had a, uh, you know, the, the horror stories being called on in school and they, oh, they, yeah. they're reading like absolute, like just absolute crap, you know, like that's, we all have that. Even now, you know, five years into narrating, I still have, you know, moments where I'm just stumbling and stammering and can't get it out. So it's what's just, one it's just word, called, what's one word you um, always have trouble with? Anything with an SH or a CH. I got a. <laughs> I've got to like stop because I've got like a little bit of an impediment going on here. So like, this sh will like fuck me up so bad. Oh <laughs> so, man, like, I am much the same. Me. Anything with a an S or a sh sound, I, it's ruined. It's ruined. <laughs> it is... yeah, I have a very hard time with certain words. So that's why like I don't really like this. Just you know, this time in my career, I don't really worry too much about people being like you mispronounced it wrong. I'm doing my best. I'm doing yeah. my best. And people know so. you're doing your best. And your best, you know, works. You know, so there's, like, no reason to be, like, as worried, maybe, as you were when you first started. Because now everyone loves your voice. And, you know, yeah. everyone stumbles. Everyone has trouble with words. Let's be honest. There's no perfect reader words out there. Are. They are. Like, why did we just, why did we make them? Words is hard. That needs to be a shirt. Somebody needs to make that. I think there is one. Actually, I, I'm pretty sure there is one. I don't need it, man. <laughs> I'll be wearing that every time I, I make a video from now on. It's like, words oh is God. hard. Or every time you like live stream and you have the camera on yourself and it's just like, words is hard. <laughs> yeah, I'll just get like a big green screen and have that in the background. People right. complaining. Like, refer to the back. Refer to the back. <laughs> That's pretty good, man. Well, this has been a great time. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and finally let me, I mean, not necessarily interview you, but just talk with you for an hour and 33 minutes. Yeah, definitely, man. This was a fun time. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, we'll definitely have to do this sometime in the future again. Maybe oh, we uh, will. get some updates, you know, talk, share some more stories. 
Oh and, man, uh, I probably got thirty more to... stories under my belt right now for you. <laughs> oh, man. We we could do this for a whole series, man. We'll be here for weeks. Well, I mean, if you really want to consider that, I'd be down. But thank you, everyone, you know, who has watched this today and decided to listen through it all. We love you. We appreciate you. So please go and like and subscribe to both of our channels. Well, I mean, everyone subscribe to his channel. Let, let's let's be honest here. Everyone knows him. But anyway, go like his channel. Go subscribe. Go like his videos. Give him that love. Thank give you, Swamp cloud. Dweller. Huh? So give me that cloud. <laughs> I think I'm the one who needs the cloud at this point in time. <laughs> cloud up my boy, Matt. Let's go. Oh, thank you. But everyone, thank you for being here. We love you. Swamp, thank you for being my guest today. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.